Hey man, in this video we're gonna build an ultra high performance, meaning speed, API latency in this video together. This idea is not new, it's based off a video I did on the main channel like a month ago that y'all really liked. And the cool thing is, the tools you're gonna learn in this video to make this high performance happen, which are Redis, Hono.js and Cloudflare workers that we're gonna use to deploy our backend you can use for anything else. We're gonna take a look at an example in this video. It's gonna be a search app, a search functionality, but this is useful for any scenario where you need seriously fast and cheap APIs. That's not just search, but anything you can imagine. We're gonna go through all concepts step-by-step step together from simple to easy, no, not too easy, from simple to hard. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through all concepts from simple to hard together, step by step. And we're also gonna take a look at the concepts. Why is this so much faster? How do we achieve these better latencies? Why is this cheaper than the traditional way of deploying Next.js? Everything together in this single video and also for completely free. Uh, you can follow along without any credit card, no payment for any tool and we're gonna do it all together in under 1.5, one and a half hours. So if you ever need serious performance in Next.js, it's gonna be super useful knowing what we're gonna do together in this video. And that's it. Let's take a look at the example, why this is so much faster, the thinking behind it, and then let's get coding and implement this together. Let's go. And this is what we're gonna build together in this video. It's called Speed Search, a high performance API built with Hono, Next.js, and Cloudflare. We can type a query below and get our results in milliseconds. So let's try this out. We can search for any country that we want. For example, let's search for Germany. And there we are. Germany found one result in 11 milliseconds. And same thing for any other country, right? If we just type an A here, then it's gonna list all the countries in here that begin with an A and list at the very bottom how many results we got in how many milliseconds how about united states of america in yeah in parentheses d all right that one interesting so we can just select that and now i want to point your attention to this one right here we can choose the engine we use for the search the postgres is arguably even the slower one and that does get especially clear in the hosted version right here these results are not very realistic because if you notice we are on local host 3000 however if we switch over to the hosted version you're gonna see a pretty big difference if we search, for example, for Azerbaijan, well, it's gonna get a cold start. That's not a very fair comparison. But in general, we're talking about 94, 95 to 100 milliseconds for Postgres. In Redis, that is very different. But let's prove my point. We are always at about 93 94 milliseconds with Postgres. Let's switch over to Redis. Let's get rid of it all and let's try this again in the Redis search mode. So right now we're at 75 milliseconds. 74 now we get 80, 70. If we type in just an A, we can see we are about 76 milliseconds. So it tends to be quite a bit faster than the Postgres search engine. Now, how do these differences happen? Why is Redis like 25% or something faster than Postgres? So I went ahead and did some benchmarks, for example, with SQLite, with Postgres and with Redis and went ahead and compared the results. Now, is this super scientific? Probably not. I did like 10 searches, just eyeballing it and then write down the times for the respective database search times. But this does allow us to get a pretty good idea of what we're talking about here. So SQLite, surprisingly also to me, was actually the slowest with on average about 110 milliseconds for the search results. Then came Postgres with about 92 milliseconds, what we just saw in the other tab. And that's about 16% faster than SQLite. And last, oops again 20 percent faster this time is redis with on average kind of about um 74 milliseconds and if we compare redis to sqlite directly that's an about 33 percent decrease and compared to Postgres, that's about 20%. So Redis is pretty damn fast, but it's not just Redis. It's the entire infrastructure that we are using to build this high performance API that I'm talking about, right? The secret here is not just using Redis, right? A high performance API doesn't just depend on Redis as the engine, which also is super fast, but there are other tools involved like Hono, like Cloudflare that help make this API super performant. And as a basic overview, I want to give you why is this so much faster than Postgres or SQLite or current high performance API setup? Well, let's take a look at the conventional way to write an API or to host your infrastructure for it, right? For example, the database we are using in this deployed application, the Postgres one, 
is deployed in Europe, in Frankfurt, right here with no additional read replicas. But once a user, for example, right here from the US West Coast makes a request, it doesn't go directly to the database, right? That doesn't happen. There's a proxy in between and that is wherever we deployed or cloud function. For example, on AWS Lambda, which Vercel uses under the hood if we use the Postgres search engine and deploy this to Vercel. And by default, I think this is hosted right here on the US East Coast. That request then has to go to the database hosted wherever you chose, right? That single region. This could be in Europe. This could also be in the US. But then imagine if the user came from somewhere else, basically the entire thing would be backwards, right? So there would still be a pretty decent bit of latency involved here. Once our database retrieved the data, it sends it back to our function, which then sends it back to the user. And that's quite a long way to go for data. If we take a look at the infrastructure behind the API we're gonna build in this video, it looks a bit different. Because the thing is, with the tools I'm gonna introduce to you that we're about to use in a second, this is how it looks like architecturally, right? Our database has multiple replicas around the entire globe, which means no matter where the user is, chances are the next region is gonna be pretty damn close to the user wherever they are. And this is also a super easy setup, right? This is not with architectural overhead at all. You're gonna see this literally takes a few mouse clicks to do um, so it's it's very very easy and the region where we deploy our function is also distributed around the globe you can imagine it very similar to our database so if a user is on the us west coast there is almost no distance that our data needs to travel it's all already there same thing if the user is in europe for example right all the important infrastructure like our function and our database is already there and same thing for the other region so you see the difference to the conventional database setup right where the database is always in one spot the function is always in another spot this kind of of setup with the tools I'm going to show you in a second allows us to get those better latencies when using the kind of fast mode, the Redis version that also uses Hono and Cloudflare in a super easy to write, super enjoyable API to actually get those um, sub 100 millisecond latencies. Whereas with Postgres, those tend to be just a tad slower. You know, on average, they tend to spike a bit more, tends to be a bit slower, I guess, on average around those 93, 92 milliseconds. Um, that I put in the benchmark down here. And that's how we achieve a really, really good performance. And we're gonna build it all together in this video. So this doesn't just apply in any way for a search, right? This is just an example. Anything that involves a database and an API, you want to be fast, works super well with this approach using, for example, Hono, a framework that we're gonna use to write or Next.js API. Super nice to write an API in Hono, by the way. And um, we're going to take a look at some examples. You're going to see exactly how this looks like. And they have full support for Vercel as well. If we take a look at that here, you can simply set up our API like this. And this kind of replaces our out of the box Next.js API. So it's a proprietary syntax. It's going to be a bit different how we write our API. But what this kind of setup allows us to do is now to deploy to not Vercel, but to Cloudflare workers directly. I did an entire video on why this is faster. For example, the Vercel logging overhead is not here. If we deploy directly to Cloudflare workers and Cloudflare workers, if you're wondering what is the role of this, um, that's basically the CF. That's the Cloudflare. I'm going to mark it for you. These are the Cloudflare workers, basically a globally distributed version of our API. So this is nothing else than hosting our Next.js backend code in Hono syntax and distributing it across the globe so it's always close to the nearest user. And lastly, for the globally distributed database, we're using AppSash for that. Of course, full disclosure, I work there, but it's generally a really nice solution. We're going to use Redis and we can have some read replicas distributed around the entire globe that basically let us have low latencies from anywhere and bypass that restriction of the database only being allowed in one certain area, right? So our final infrastructure will look very similar to this with a lot of distributed database instances and a lot of distributed function instances. So no matter where the user is, it's always going to be close to them versus in the conventional setup, that is not the case. And that's how we get the really nice latencies. So as I said, we're gonna do it all together in this video. It's gonna look nice. You can put it on your portfolio if you want. There's even a little animation I put in here uh, just for fun. You know, it, it doesn't add any functionality, but I think it looks nice. And if you decide to put this on your portfolio, um, then it's gonna look even better with an animation. The functionality I try to keep as simple as humanly possible to really focus on the high performance, on the speed, of the API route, 
and not get too caught up in the actual search functionality because chances are you might need that, you might not need that. Um, this is just an example to demonstrate the API speed. Now, to get started with all of this, open up your command line and we're gonna navigate to our desktop, at least I will. This depends on where you want the project you know, to live on your PC. I generally put these on my desktop and we're gonna say pnpm dlx create dash next dash app and let me zoom in so you can see this easier at the latest. And then we can give this a name, for example, let's call this fast API and hit enter. Before I'm gonna hit enter, by the way, if you're wondering what this is, pnpm dlx, well, it's basically telling Next.js to install the dependencies using pnpm, which is just a package manager. You could use npm or npx just as well. Same thing with yarn. I just personally prefer pnpm because that caches very efficiently uh, through symlinks. But that's just a tiny detail. If you want to use any other package manager, just replace this part right here and then hit enter. And that's going to ask us a bunch of questions like TypeScript. Yes, we do. ESLint. Yes, we do to ensure code quality. Tailwinds. CSS, yes, I like it. Source directory, this is very much personal preference. I prefer it as well. I think the code looks a bit nicer, a bit more readable that way. And the app router, yes. And no, we don't want to um, customize the default import alias. And then hit enter. That's gonna install all the dependencies. And this is a beauty of PNPM. It added 353 dependencies up until this point, but it only downloaded actually Two, and it achieves that through symlinks. Now I could do a whole video on how that works. Basically, it's a caching mechanism on your system that reuses packages instead of installing them separately in every NPM modules that you have on your PC, which is very efficient. Um, but I guess if you don't like PNPM for any reason, um, then you could also use Yarn or NPM, same thing. Okay, we can navigate into the folder we just created. We call it fast API and then say code dot. And all that's gonna do is open up this project in VS code. It's gonna do it right here on my second monitor. So let's drag this over. Um, and you could also navigate into the folder yourself and then right click and open with VS code, same exact thing. And the beautiful thing is now already all the dependencies are installed using PNPM. Now let's verify that everything worked correctly. We can simply start up our development server. And oh, I already have an app running on that port. So let me quickly stop that. Let's run yarn dev, npm run dev or pnpm run dev once again. And that's gonna open up our basic next project on localhost 3000. So let's try this out. I already have localhost 3000 open here. So let's refresh the page. And we should see the very basic um, Next.js kind of setup without any functionality. So let's let this load. Sometimes this does take a pretty long time, especially the kind of cold starts when you first start this, like 2.4 seconds. Ah, that's kind of a lie, I guess. I think it took longer, but anyways, um, there we have it. We have a basic Next.js page, perfect. This is a very, very nice place to start. Now, since I wanna show you how this works under the hood, let's start with a very, very simple implementation on the front end. That allows us to get to the actual high performance API really quickly and then kind of build out the UI and make it look good. So if we had to visualize this, um, let's go into dark mode again. By the way, light mode looks absolutely dark water. Step one is gonna be uh, basic, very, very basic front end. Then step two is gonna be high performance API. And lastly, the step three is gonna be make things not look bad. So essentially make things look nice, you know? These are the three steps we're gonna follow. First, build the basic front end and then get to the high performance API in the next like five minutes. Cause as you're gonna see the React implementation of this part um, is gonna be really, really straightforward. So first thing we're gonna do, and let me make this much larger for you so you have an easier time seeing what's up here. First thing we're gonna do is go to the very, very top of the page.tsx that Next.js generates for us. And the reason we go at the top here is to say use client. This is basically telling Next.js to render this page on the client side, which is a requirement for us to use things like React hooks. For example, the state hook. Now I have a snippet for this, but since you probably don't have it, let's declare state manually right here. Um, and we're gonna worry about the return in a second here. Um, so for example, we're gonna say const empty array, we're gonna worry about that in a second, is gonna be equal to use state. 
that we import from React. And this is going to be a string, which you can pass in as a generic to tell TypeScript what the value of this will be. And then let's initialize this as an empty string. Now, do we have to do this for TypeScript? No, TypeScript is actually smart enough to infer the value by itself. And we can see that if we destructure from the array, the uh, input, and let's also call this set input right here. So as you can see, the input is automatically inferred as a string. And so is the input for the set input as a string. But this is just personal preference. I like doing this because chances are if this didn't have a string as an initial value, then the inference, of course, doesn't work. And we will need to tell React explicitly what this is. So why not just do it anyways? And I think it's also very nice and readable. So that's just personal preference that I like to do in all my projects and chances are you might like it too. So next up, we're going to declare one more state. And this is going to be, let's call use state and worry about the array destructuring here in a second. And we're going to leave this empty. We're going to initialize this as undefined. But again, we're going to pass a generic into here to tell TypeScript what the type of the value will be later on. And this is going to be the results. And this is going to be a string array. These are going to be the actual country matches that we get, like Germany, like the United States of America, like India, and so on. That's going to be the results as a string array. And then the second thing is going to be the duration. How long did it take to get our data from the database? This is going to be a number. And that's what I showed you in the previews right here. That's how we measure the latency it takes to kind of search for these countries. So if we were to search for a country right here, I think it's Azerbaijan. There we go. Um, or Germany or India. That's how we measure the latency at the very bottom right here. That's going to be our duration we're saving. Perfect. Okay, let's get started with the UI. Finally, a very basic implementation could look like this, where we have a div in the return statement, and we also have an input right here. Now, to make this a controlled input, we already have our state, and we basically want to save what the user typed in the input right here in the state. The way we do that is by passing a value, which is going to be the input, and an onChange handler. In the onChange handler, we get access to a callback function that contains an event. So let's call this just e. And then let's say set input to the e.target.value. Just like that. So we're saving whatever the user input in this HTML input field right up here in state. And the reason we are doing this is going to become very clear right now. So inside of a use effect, right? Let's put that right down here. This receives a callback function as well. And this receives a dependency array. Basically, every time the input changes, every time the user types something into the field, we want this callback function in the use effect to run and fetch our most recent data. So to do this, we can define a custom function. Let's call it, for example, fetch data. And this will be an asynchronous function right here, an arrow function. Um, so we can make a request to our backend and await it. And then at the bottom, we're going to call this fetch data function um, just like so. So when this use effect runs, it calls the fetch data function. There we go. The logic is being executed. But if we don't have an input, so if the input is an empty string, for example, in that case, we're going to return early. We don't want any logic to happen. And we want to reset the search results because if the input is empty, chances are the user also deleted what was in the input. And we want to clear all the search results. The way we do this is by destructuring the search results and also by convention, the set search results from the use state hook right up here. And now we can use that and return set search results. And we're going to set this to undefined, essentially removing all the data that is inside of the state um, when the input is set to an empty string. Now, if the input is actually any word, any string that is valid, that is truthy, so this if condition doesn't get triggered, in that case, we're going to make a request to our backend for the actual countries that match the user query. Let's say const res is going to be equal to await, fetch, super simple functionality, no React query in here, no Axios, nothing. Um, I just want to show you how to write, how to write a really fast API, and we don't need those tools um, to do this. So we're going to make a fetch request to the slash API slash search. And then we want to pass a query parameter. Now we can call this anything we want. I decided to call it Q for query. And this is going to be equal to and then in the dynamic kind of syntax right here. Um, so this is a template string and we can now dynamically insert values here. 
that's gonna be the input, so what the user actually typed in. Now, let's try this out already, right? Let's save this page and let's start our development server. It is already started, fantastic. And then let's go into our network tab and see if this actually works. So whenever we type something in here, like an A, for example, we should see a network request being made to our backend. And there is, which is perfect. Let's zoom in here. And we can see a network request is being fired to localhost 3000 API slash search. Perfect. Right now we get a 404 because this endpoint does not exist. There is no endpoint to receive this search query and that's perfectly fine it makes sense and this is where we use the first tool in this video which is hono.js a next.js compatible fast lightweight web standards following framework for or backend and they have a native next.js implementation like a starter kit um, so the implementation is honestly super basic they explain how to do it here and this is what we're going to follow right now so let's navigate into our project and you're going to see how simple this is in our app folder. Let's create a new folder and call this API. This is gonna be our backend, right? Front end API folder is gonna be our backend. Inside of here, new folder. And then in two angled brackets, like the JavaScript array syntax, for example, dot, 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 route, and then two closing angled brackets. What is the syntax, you might ask? What the hell is this? Basically, it's a catch all route. So when we make a request to slash API slash whatever, whatever, then it's still going to be received by this endpoint. Whereas if we had just route in here, you don't need to follow along with this, then only if we made a request to specifically curl uh, HTTP localhost 3000 slash API slash route, now it would match our folder structure, right? Because we have a literal route right here. But if we wanted to change this to slash API slash search, for example, well, there wouldn't be an endpoint to receive that. In our syntax that we have right here with the angled brackets, this would still be caught um, for our call request because anything that comes after the API will be matched by the syntax. And inside of here, let's create a new route.ts file this time. Now for the actual logic, we're not going to use the built-in Next.js endpoints. I don't like them that much anymore because the better alternative or the faster alternative, at least for this video, is going to be Hono. So we're going to say pnpm install, npm install yarn, add whatever you want. And that's going to be Hono and hit enter. That's going to install that dependency. And by the way, if you're wondering how many downloads does Hono get? Well, basically recently it's been gaining a lot of traction and that's for good reason. It's a really nice framework, small, simple, ultra fast web framework for the edges. It works on any JavaScript runtime, so it's super flexible. And we are going to make use of the Cloudflare workers um, that it works there. It's going to be very, very useful for us. But if you want it, you could even deploy this on Vercel. But then some performance benefits of the high performance API um, would not be there because Cloudflare workers are extremely cheap and they are extremely fast and performant as well. So we're going to make use of them. Now, after installing our Hono dependency, let's start back up our development server and let's do a couple of things. First off, let's export a const, oops, const runtime from this route.ts and this is going to be equal to edge. So if you were to deploy this on Vercel, this would still under the hood at least be deployed to Cloudflare workers because that's what Vercel uses under the hood. If we deploy straight to Cloudflare workers, you don't need this, but um, this way, this is compatible with both Vercel and Cloudflare workers directly without any modification, which I think is a super nice thing. Now, the actual app, right? right? Let's say const app, and this is going to be equal to a new Hono that we import from Hono at the very top. And we can simply invoke this class and instantiate it like that. And we can even give this a base path as a string, and this is going to be slash API. So basically, if we were to make a request to slash API slash search, we wouldn't have to specify that every single one of our routes, like for example, the app.get that we're going to declare right here, like for the slash search, and then the um, function that's going to handle the logic when a request is made to this HTTP endpoint, we don't have to specify slash API each time because we pass the base path once. And that's just something super common you're gonna see in every good backend framework. Um, for example, in Fastify that we used at my previous job or in Express or in Hono and so many other languages and frameworks um, like the base path functionality is super, super common. 
Now, in the callback function, Honol gives us access to something called C, which is the context that we can receive right here. And then let's already return some C.json just to make Honol and TypeScript happy. And this doesn't have to contain anything yet. Basically, this is the setup for our high performance API. It doesn't use the regular Next.js syntax. However, we can make this actually compatible with the basic Next.js syntax. So we get the performance benefits of deploying this to Cloudflare, but also the compatibility benefits of deploying this to Vercel if we wanted to. And doing that is one line of code. It's extremely easy. We can export a const and then the HTTP verb, which is, for example, get. This could also be post whatever you want to handle. And this is going to be handle and then just wrap or app. And if you're wondering where this comes from, this comes from Hono slash Vercel. So they have a Vercel integration we can use. Um, if you want to deploy this to Vercel, then this will handle our requests or the user requests. And if we deploy this to Cloudflare workers directly, we can export default app as never at the very bottom. Now, why the as never? Basically, that's a kind of hacky TypeScript workaround to make the Next.js compiler happy because by default, it doesn't really like a default export from an API route. It doesn't expect it, so it's going to give us an error. Um, however, that's not any important error. We can simply bypass it with the as never and then everything works super, super smoothly. Perfect. We can save this file and this is literally the entire setup we need for a super high performance API that we can now deploy to Cloudflare workers. And in doing so, we should notice that the 404 error that we used to get on localhost whenever we wrote anything inside of our input should now be gone because the API route to catch that request now exists. And by the way, did we name this slash search by the way? Yes, we did. So this is going to be important for later, but we did name the slash search. So let's restart our server, head over to the network tab under the fetch requests and then type in anything and that's going to get us a 200 OK with an empty response because that's what we sent back from Hono. Perfect. Very, very nice. This means we set up everything correctly and we're now ready to get set up with our database to give actual search results right here in the response. To get set up with our globally distributed database that I talked about earlier right here. So basically we get this kind of infrastructure, which is faster then the conventional one, we're going to use Upstash. And um, now again, full disclosure, I worked there. That's how these videos are possible. But even if I didn't work there, I've used them before. And let's log in on my second monitor. There we go. And the service is just nice. It's just really damn nice. That's that's all I have to say. Um, and that's how we achieve the speed um, in this video. So we're going to navigate over to the Redis tab right here. Oh, and basically this is free as well. Like it doesn't cost us anything. It's free tier. Uh, so this is just um, really nice. So we can click the create database. Let's give this a name like fast API, for example. And you could even go regional, right? I guess some performance benefits would be lost. What the regional means is basically you choose to only have one database replica somewhere. But if we wanted to read replicas around the globe, so no matter where the users, this is always going to be close. Um, in that case, the global makes more sense with a primary region and then the regions you want um, the read replicas to be in. So basically what this does is if you executed a Redis command, like set full bar, for example, as a Redis command, then this would not only be propagated to your primary database, but this would also be propagated to any replicas, uh, replica one, for example, any replicas that you have, right? So if we have one in kind of India region or something and one in US region and the primary one in Europe, then this foo bar key value pair would be present in all of them. So no matter where the user is, they're going to have a pretty fast time retrieving data from your database. And that results in the faster search times, right? So let's go with the global one. And for example, we can select one. That's what I used to do personally. Um, that's what I like to do. It's one in the US and one in South East, like Singapore, for example. So we have basically the entire globe covered. So this would be very similar to this setup that you can see right here. No matter where the user is, it's always going to be one database pretty damn close to where they are. And we're going to hit create. That's going to create the database for us and also give us a way to connect to our database right here. Connect to your database. We can choose JavaScript. And I'm just going to copy this over for our seeding script, because what we're going to do together is insert data into our database, which are going to be the countries, right, that we search for. 
Like, I don't know why I keep coming back to Azerbaijan, by the way, but uh, any country, right? We want to have a list of all countries, A, B, C, and so on, to kind of search through and need to get them into our database. So that's what we're going to create something called a seeding script for um, to get all that data into our database once so we can then always search it in our API endpoints. Sounds more complicated than it really is. Let's go into our source folder, create a new folder called lib, which stands for libraries, by the way. So basically, it's a convention in this folder to prepare libraries to be used in your project. At least that's what I always use it for, and that's what we use it for at work, at my previous work, and so on. So it is a pretty common convention. Inside of here, we're going to create a seed.ts file. And first thing we need is to paste what we just got from Upstash and also initialize or install or Redis. So we're going to say pnpm install at upstash slash Redis. That's going to install our Redis SDK to connect to our database via HTTP. Save that. Perfect. And now what we need is, well, a list of every country there is in the world. We don't want to type this out um, ourselves. And this was just some debugging I did. Not important. Uh, and there is actually some mad guy that actually typed this out himself. Um, right here. I'm going to link this GitHub just in the description. Basically, it's a list of all the countries there are in the world that we are going to use to put them into our database to make them searchable, right? So you don't need to Google this. I'm going to link this GitHub just um, in the description directly. So you can just go ahead, grab all the countries and then paste them right here in our application. By the way, we can also open this up in a kind of side by side just to make this look better and to see what the hell we're actually doing. Um, right here on the right hand side. So perfect. We have the country list. All right. And that's the perfect basis to put everything into our database now. So below the country list, we're going to say country list dot for each. And we are going to execute some logic for each country. And why is the VS code intelligence taking up that much space on the screen? That looks absolutely horrendous. So I'm going to zoom out a bit. Hopefully that fixes things. And basically for each country in the country list as a string, we want to put it in our database. And in order to make this searchable, the algorithm we're going to use to do so is inspired as I probably teased in the very beginning of the video, which I didn't record yet, but uh, I will. And I'm probably going to mention it there. Um, is create The algorithm is created by the founder of Redis, which is Antires. And it basically works like this. We have a word, let's say, for example, um, Germany, right, as the country, then how we break that down and make it searchable is basically like this. First off, we have a G in our Redis database. Then, oops, then we are going to have a GE in all uppercase, by the way. Everything is going to be in uppercase in our database. Um, so the user input is not going to be case sensitive. Then we're going to have GER. So basically for every letter, we're going to make a composed instance of it that leads up all the way ger m, then ger may, and so on and so on. You can probably imagine. Uh, I don't need to tell you. And then the last entry is going to be the entire word Germany. So the finished thing that we want to suggest to the user and with a star at the end. So we know this is the entire word. So basically, when you type in G, when you type in G, E, G, R, and so on, no matter which combination of the above you type in, the search bar is always going to suggest you the word with a star at the end and not these. These should never be suggested. These are just to make this one searchable, right? And that's a really clever algorithm to make Redis search possible. Um, that we're going to make use of, made by the creator of Redis. And I think it's really, really clever to allow very fast searches, evidently, as I showed you in the preview. That's how it's possible. And to make this algorithm work, let's say const term, and this is going to be equal to the country dot, oops, country dot to uppercase. As I mentioned, these are all going to be uppercase, so there's no case sensitivity involved in the search. And let's also initialize a new const and call it terms as the plural and to tell TypeScript what this will be. This will be an object with a score of zero. All of them will have a score of zero and a member. And this is going to be the string. This is going to be the country. And this is going to be an array of these objects we can initialize as an empty array. Now, to get all the combinations for all the countries into this array, let's start off with a for loop. 
So the iterator is going to be called i. So from let i equals to zero, we're going to go to i is smaller than the term dot length. So how long is the string? And of course, we're going to go in one step. So for each character, right, the g, g, e, g, e, r, and so on. That's what we're doing right now. And basically, we're going to push into the terms. So terms dot push, and we are going to push the substring of the main word from zero to the actual index that we're on. That's how we get every combination of the word um, into our array. So we're going to say terms dot push. And then here we're going to say the score is going to be zero. And the member is going to be the term and term dot substring. And this is going to go from zero to the current index that we're iterating over just like this. Perfect. And below this for loop, we're going to say terms dot push, right? So this is every letter combination. And now we want to push the final thing with a star at the end. So what we're actually suggesting to the person searching in our app, that's what we're pushing now, the star thing. So to do this, we're going to do basically same thing. Score is going to be zero, but the member is going to be the final term. So the actual country name plus the star at the end. So we know this is a word we want to suggest instead of just the words we use to make this final term searchable. And then as the final thing we're going to do in here is declare a const populate db. And this is going to be an async arrow function in which we just say await redis dot z add. So we're adding to a sorted set, which is basically just a redis data structure. And I can show you that redis sorted set where basically we have key value pairs, but every entry also has a score attached to it. And is there any good example I can show you to see this? Well, maybe as the images. Yeah, this makes sense. So let's see this one. Basically, we have a rank for each entry with a score and the member, the member being our country and the score being zero. And that we can then search by the rank later. That's going to allow the search functionality. So basically what you need to take away from this sorted sets are a Redis data structure that we can use um, to make this possible. And in order to use it, we can give it a um, key. This is the single entry, the single namespace. All the following values are going to be stored as in our database and we can simply spread in the terms. Now the TypeScript implementation of this kind of lags, but trust me, this works. So this is an error we can totally ignore. Um, I don't know why it happens. We might have some TypeScript incompatibility in our uh, SDK for Redis. I'm not sure, but this is an error that's totally fine to ignore. We're just going to execute this once. It works and we never touch this file again, essentially. And then we can run the populate db function right at the bottom here. Now, if we run this file, that's going to put all combinations of all countries into our Redis database and build the foundation for our fast performance search. So to try this out, let's install one package, pnpm install, as a development dependency because we don't need this in production later on, and that's going to be tsx. And all that tsx does is it allows us to easily run TypeScript files as if they were JavaScript files without the transpilation and so on. So what we can do is say yarn tsx and then navigate to this kind of location, which is source slash lib slash seed dot ts and hit enter. And that's going to prompt tsx to run our file, connect to our database, run through this for loop and put every country into our database. And it did that in 2.6 seconds. Perfect. So what we should see now is if you go over to your uh, upstash data browser, Right here, we should be able to see the terms, right? That's what the key is for here. And if we click that, then we should be able to see. And if I zoom out a bit, and uh, there we go, that all the countries and all the combinations are in here. And all the countries that we actually suggest to users for the above combinations have a star at the end. So we know this is something to suggest, right? Perfect. This works really, really nice. And that's how we make all the countries searchable through an in-memory very fast data store, which is Redis. Now, how do we make this data show up in our search? And wow, dude, this just looks horrible. Um, again, that's going to be step three, right? Making this look good. But let's at least, like at the very least, change the class name on the input to be a text, let's say zinc. And do this suggestion from VS Code takes up way too much space. Maybe I need to change that sometimes so it doesn't appear. Um, anyways, oh, and is the 
oh, we need to start back up our development server and let's give the input a class name of text zinc 900. That's gonna make the text we put in there dark. And hopefully at least we'll be able to see what um, we're typing in. So we can see for which term we get the results here in a second from our backend. So actually we can show the data we have in our Redis database um, right here in our UI. Okay, great. So as we type something in, let's say AST right here, a query is made to our backend every time. Perfect, that's exactly what we want. And now the question is how do we extract the search term on the backend and then search our database with it? Right, that's the question. How do we do it? Let's switch over to OrRouter.ts on the backend and let me show you how to do this. Because while it's different than regular Next.js, it's not actually very hard. The first thing we're gonna do is define a type. And that type is gonna be named env.config for or environment variables. And this is gonna hold two things. First off, the up, oops, the up stash underscore redis underscore rest underscore token. And this will be of type string. And the second one is gonna be the upstash underscore redis underscore rest underscore URL. And this is also going to be a string. The reason why we're doing this, this env config type is so we can get access to our environment variables inside of the API route. And that is the core difference between regular Next.js and Hono. In regular Next, you can, for example, everywhere access the process.env values. In the Cloudflare worker runtime, there is no process.env because this is a Node.js thing, a Node.js runtime thing, and the worker D runtime that Cloudflare uses does not allow process.env. It works different there. The way we get access to environment variables in Cloudflare is like this. We can destructure them from the env, which is a helper we get from hodo slash adapter, and we can simply wrap the C inside of it. Now to make this type safe, because currently it is not, we don't know what is stored in our env values, we can pass the env config right here as a generic into the env function. And now this is type safe, so we can get the upstash redis rest token as well as the upstash redis rest url just like this, and then go ahead and instantiate our redis instance to actually communicate with our database right here inside of this API route. The way we do that is by saying const redis is equal to a new redis instance or class, should I say, we get from upstash slash redis and we can pass two things in here. That is the token and this is going to be the upstash underscore redis rest token as you can probably imagine and then the URL, oops, URL and that is going to be our upstash redis rest URL. There we go. Now we have access to our database on the backend, the Redis instance. And now getting access to the search query. So what the user typed in is also really easy. Let's say const query is going to be equal to, and then the c.rec, that's how we get access to the incoming request, dot query. And in here, we want to pass the query parameter that we called it, right? So we called it Q. So imagine the URL was like HTTP, whatever, 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 slash search, and then Q is equal to, uh, let's say GER. So the beginning of Germany, for example, then this, and let's change the font. This is hard to read. Then this part, the GER is gonna be part of the Q parameter of the request and gonna be saved here as the query. Right, so this is incidental that it's the same name, right? This is the query parameters, and this is what we're calling this um, in memory. So the Q, so the GER in this case, for example, whatever we get from the incoming request, and we're gonna save that as the query constant right here. And if there is no query passed into this API route, in that case, we're gonna return, let's scroll down a bit, a c.json, and in here we can say, as the message that we want to pass inside of this object, we're going to say invalid search query. And now as the status, which is the second object we can pass in here, we're going to pass 400, so invalid or bad request, however you want to call it, right? To let the user know, hey, you forgot to pass the Q parameter when making this request. So for example, if you just omitted that, then of course that would be an invalid request. We don't know what to search for. And now we get to the fun part, which is implementing this algorithm. Basically, the user can search for any of these. And if it matches any of these search terms, the query, then we give back the item, the nearest item with a star, right? That's the algorithm we're going to implement. It's pretty straightforward and it works really nice and really fast. 
The way we're gonna do this is by first declaring an empty array. Let's call this res, because this is later going to be the response we sent back from this API route. And let's also declare a const called rank. And this will come from our database. This will be await redis.zrank. So we can use the rank command for a sorted set. And in here, we're going to pass two things. First one is going to be the name under which we store all that we want to make searchable. So in our case, that's going to be terms. And the second thing is going to be the query. And now you might notice that the await keyword is highlighted in red. And that's because we did not mark this whole thing as asynchronous. So let's do that and then the await will work. Now, what does the Z rank do? Basically, it gives us back the rank of the query inside of our sorted set. So you can see that each um, item in here has a score and it has a member and the rank in here is the how manyth item it is. And this is going to be really useful right now. So before we continue, let's do a quick check. If the rank is not equal to null and the rank is not equal to undefined, only in that case we want to continue because if the rank is null then that means we don't have any results for our search query if the term we search for right for the query that the user is searching for is not a member then of course we can't show any results because that is not something we have in our database and therefore we need to do a check and we're only going to continue our search if it actually exists in our database if not that's the case we're going to handle in a second we're just going to give back an empty array because we couldn't match anything there are no search results in here let's define a const temp which stands for temporary because we won't need it anymore in a second it's just to temporary hold a value and that value is going to be a weight redis.z range which is the range for a sorted set and in here we're going to search in or terms kind of namespace right the what we call this entire set we're going to pass in two things the minimum as a number and the maximum as a number and these are the ranks we are filtering by so the minimum is the rank we just found out that's where we are starting right so if for example we matched this search term then we also want to include in the temp everything that comes behind it all the items right here until and that's the point we reach the star item because we're also matching that that's exactly what we want to show to the user right all the prior stuff that doesn't contain the star is just for searchability so we're going to start at rank so if you typed in afgha we would start right here and then as the maximum we're going to say oops as the maximum we're going to say rank plus 100 this is kind of arbitrary i think 100 is a fair um, kind of assumption to make which means if we match this one so the user typed in a f g h a then we include the next 100 elements and um, to also see which elements match from it containing the star so we can show those to the user technically yes you could go for 50 more you could go for 200 more which would increase the computational cost of this whole thing um, i think 100 is a good idea um, but of course you can change this if you notice that it doesn't work very well for your app but this is a pretty good default that mostly works for a lot of use cases now we're gonna enter a for loop right here so for each let's say const l for element of temp we're gonna execute some logic there we go so in this case an element is nothing more than one string match right here like Alger, like Algeri, like Algeria, each one of these is going to be one element of or temp because this will give us back a string array. And we know that, but TypeScript doesn't know that. It thinks that this is an unknown array. So to make this very clear to TypeScript, what we're getting back is a string array of these members right here. We can simply pass in a string array explicitly and tell TypeScript that, hey, what we're getting back is in fact a string array. So it can infer that each element like this one or this one or this one are in fact a string and we can work with them a bit easier. And the goal of this for loop is to construct an array to push those elements that we want to show to the user. So only the ones that contain a star, that's what we want to filter by. Therefore, if not the element dot starts with, which is a string command we can use in JavaScript with the query. So if the result doesn't start with the search query, we're gonna break in that case we just don't want to continue but in the case of if the element dot ends with a star which is the important thing we are looking for all that means is that this is in fact a search result that we want to show to the user that we want to send over the wire back to the front end therefore we're going to push it into the res the response we're going to say res dot push and we're going to push the element 
dot substring and we're gonna go from the index of zero so the very first letter to the element dot length minus one so we're sending back the entire thing except the star at the very end because of course we don't want to show that to users right why would they want to see a star at the end of their search results doesn't make sense so just the word except the star we're sending back over the wire now one thing that i added in here is to count how long this actually takes to make the comparison so to show users how long did your search take this is of course fully optional but i think it is a nice addition so let's quickly implement that and in doing so you're going to learn one very very cool javascript api which is the let's say const start the performance um, api we can say performance.now this will give us back a number of when this um, started executing so the exact point in time right here that we can measure and then at the very bottom when we're done with all the logic um, right here we can also include a little comment kind of just space it out visually and then say const end is equal to performance.now as well so we have two points in time we have the start and the end well the other way around right so the start and the end of this entire operation how long it took and we can simply send back to the front end the duration which is nothing else than the end minus the start right because both of these are numbers we can simply subtract them and that's easy that's how long this took as a number and in milliseconds by the way this is going to be in milliseconds and as for the results we're going to send back to the front end that's simply going to be our res array now only containing a string or which is a string array of only the names and um, without the star and not with any element that we only want to use for searchability. Now, as a kind of best practice, what's a really good idea to um, do before you deploy this to production is grabbing the entire logic inside the app.get and simply wrapping it inside of a try catch block. Let's name this error, just in case anything goes wrong, paste the existing logic as is in the try block. We're not changing anything about it, but if anything goes wrong, right, we're gonna land in the catch block and can handle the error accordingly. For example, one thing I always do is console.error, the error. So you're gonna see this in your actual runtime logs in case anything goes wrong. And secondly, we can return a c.json back to the front end, for example, with the results being an empty array. And we can also send back a message. And this can be, for example, uh, something went wrong, period. And then, of course, we also want to adjust the status of this. So let's say, for example, 500. So the user will get a 500 error on the front end. Um, if you want, you could also check which error is coming back with which status code and handle it according to that. But I think this is a very simple, very good way to go about things um, in this demo application. Perfect, that's the logic done. Very nice, let's see if this works. Let's give our front end a lot more space. And I know this front end looks absolutely horrendous. Trust me, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna make it look good. For now, let's search for, for example, uh, IND. Oh, and we get a 500 error, something went wrong, okay. Uh, so ideally it should show us a country like india right now but it doesn't why doesn't it do that cannot read properties of undefined reading starts with and a very likely reason of why this happens is the following we didn't create a env file at the very root of our project so what's happening here is that it's trying or api route is trying to create a redis instance with our environment variables but these are actually undefined because we've never defined them anywhere. So let's create a .env file where it can draw these values from and also go to upstash and then the details and under .env, oh, it seems like this no longer exists. Anyways, let's create it ourselves then. Let's go into our route.ts, copy the upstash redis rest token and paste it into our .env file. That's gonna be the name of this environment variable. And then as the value, let's copy the token from the upstash dashboard with or without quotes. I don't think it really matters. And let's paste it here. And then the second thing we want to copy over from our route.ts is going to be the URL. So let's copy that over as well. And this is going to be equal to the URL. You can see listed right here and hit save on that. And while we are doing this, we can already do one other important step and that's gonna be important later for deployment to Cloudflare workers to make this publicly accessible, to make it um, really, really fast. And that's gonna be also at the very root of our project, creating a wrangler.toml. Basically, Wrangler is a tool made by Cloudflare that lets us super easily 
deploy to Cloudflare workers directly. And in order for Cloudflare to have access to these environment variables, we need to define them in orangler.toml. So this takes only a couple things. First of the name, let's call this fast API, for example. Second thing, this takes the compatibility underscore date. And this is going to be 2024, 04, 02. So the 2nd of April, 2024. And then two lines down, we're going to pass in the vars, the environment variables. And this is nothing else than the exact same thing we have in our .env file, just so Cloudflare can access it once we are in the worker runtime. And I'm not sure if this is needed, by the way, but I'm going to separate the actual values with a space from the equal sign and then hit save. That's how I did it in the demo. Again, I'm not sure if it's really needed, but I know it works like this, so uh, let's just do it. And that's gonna be important for later. We don't need that right now. We can close out of the env and the wrangler.toml, and that's done. Now, with this in place, what should happen is that our search now works. So when we enter a name like ind for India, first off, we get a 200 response, which is very nice. And let's see if we actually get India back. And we don't. Okay, interesting. So we get back an empty results array, but we do actually get the correct duration for this. So let's see why this doesn't work. Let's give this a bit less space. So something is apparently going wrong in our route.ts that's causing this whole thing to not um, put the correct results in our array. So I'm going to take a second to debug this and then I'm going to be right back. Oh, and without even debugging, I think I already know where the problem is. And that is currently the query is actually case sensitive. We're never converting it to uppercase, right? Because if we look in our data browser, everything we have in here is once that loads is uppercase, right? But the query currently is exactly how the user types it. If it's lowercase, it's lowercase. And let's validate if that is the issue by simply typing this in in uppercase. And that should work. So let's go into our network tab. Let's read out the page and type in IND. And let's see if we get results now. And we do. India and Indonesia. Perfect. Very, very nice. So we are sure that this is the issue now. So we can very easily fix it by appending the dot to uppercase right here to our query. By the way, with a question mark, because if this doesn't exist, then we also can't convert it to an uppercase. Um, so this is some optional chaining right here to make sure. And with that in place, even if we type IND in lowercase now, we should get all the relevant um, results. IND in our network tab, and we do, perfect. India, Indonesia. What about United? Do we get the United States, United Arab Emirates? United Kingdom of Great Britain and North. That is a long, long name, dude. And because we only included the first 100 after our rank, that's probably why the US isn't included here. So if you wanted to, you could just you know bump this up 200, 250, 500, whatever. Just beware that this will actually cause more compute in memory um, on your edge function. But that's not a big deal either. Um, especially at this scale, like that's not a problem. But perfect, very, very nice. We know this works now. And now our job is to, well, basically it's two things, right? First off, making this look good. This looks absolutely like dog water. And secondly, actually deploying this to the cloud to see that this is actually really fast and working in production. Okay, a little cut there because for me it's the next day, but I very vividly remember that we wanted to make this look like not absolute dog water, right? Because this absolutely looks horrible. And let's do that. And we're going to start right here in the JSX, where we're going to change the div that we return at the top level to a main. Now, this main is going to get a class name, and that's going to be of height, screen, oops, screen, and with screen. And we're also going to apply a grainy texture in here. Now, this is not something that Tailwind has out of the box. This doesn't apply anything. This is something we can define ourselves, and that's going to make our entire page look really nice with a kind of background texture. And we're going to um, put that right here in our globals.css, this grainy texture. However, all this grainy texture really is, and that might be a bit small right here, um, it's basically just a base64 encoded string, right? And we're not going to type that out ourselves. So I prepared you a copy paste list you can use to follow along with this video, uh, because there is absolutely no point in typing this out. We don't want to do that. Uh, so just grab the grainy texture from the copy paste list I linked in the description 
and uh, it's going to be the very top item in there just go ahead grab that and paste it in here and you can see the reason why we don't want to type this out right this doesn't make any sense and um, so we're just going to paste it here in our globals.css and that's going to apply the grainy texture right here to this class name if we save that we can already see what happens there is our grainy texture very very nice and the input still remains right here. Now below the main, let's put a div and this div is gonna get a class name and let's give this just a bit less space of um, flex, a flex dash call, a gap of six, an items dash center, a padding top of 32, a duration of 500. This is gonna be important for the animation we're gonna add to this, this is the transition duration. Let's add an animate dash in an animate, then a fade in five. And the last class name is gonna be a slide in from bottom of 2.5. Now these class names also don't exist out of the box in Tailwind. That is why we're gonna install one package for this. Let's clear this and that's gonna pnpm install at Tailwind CSS slash an oops, animate and then hit enter. That's gonna and why did that not work? Did I misspell something? Oh, this is not at Tailwind CSS slash animate, but it is a Tailwind CSS dash animate without the at, and then replace the slash with a hyphen, and then hit enter. That's what the package is called. There we go. And what that allows us to do, once that is installed, we can already navigate into our tailwind.config.ts to the very bottom where we define the plugins we want to use with our Tailwind. And in here, we can now require this plugin we just installed, which is Tailwind CSS dash animate. And once we save that, that's actually gonna give meaning to the class names we have just put in here um, to make the animation work. And to validate if it works, we can already grab the closing div and move it behind our input and insert some example text. We're gonna get rid of this in a second. We just want to make sure that the animation works. And in order to do that, we need to start back up our development server. So let's quickly do that. And then hopefully we should see once that ha has all loaded, the example text kind of fade in smoothly from the bottom if we set everything up correctly. And it does, but it's um, it's white. It's super hard to see. Let's quickly give this a text zinc of 900 class name to a p tag and put the text in there. You don't need to follow along with this. I'm, I'm just doing this to show this to you. So we can see it smoothly fades in from the bottom. Perfect. That looks really, really nice. And we can continue knowing that our animation works super smoothly. Okay. So in here above the input and below the div or inside of the div, we're going to create an H1 element with a class name of text dash five XL, a tracking dash tight. We're going to give this a font dash bold and that's already it and inside of this h1 we're gonna say speed oops, speed search but really this can be anything right it, it doesn't really matter this is just for um kind of decorational purposes and this text appears to be white which looks super awkward and no contrast the out of the box and um, so we're gonna go into our globals.css and quickly get rid of some stuff we don't need which is this entire stuff i don't know why it put that there didn't do that in my demo project we don't need that let's get rid of it and uh, hit save on that and then our text will be black. So we only have the kind of tailwind initialization. We have the utilities layer and then the grainy texture that we put there. Great. Below our h1, let's go ahead and put a p tag and this is going to get a class name of text zinc 600, a text of large, a maximum width of pros and a text dash center. And inside of here, we're going to say a high performance API built with Hono, oops, Hono, not Hobo, next.js and cloud, oops, cloud flare, period. Let's insert a BR, a bracket, a break element in HTML. And right behind that, let's say, type a query below and get your results in milliseconds, period. And again, this is just for decorational purposes. You can follow along with this if you want. You don't have to. Um, this is very much personal preference. And then right below that, let's create a div, right below this p tag and right above our input element. Let's create a div here. And this div is gonna get a class name of maximum width of MD for medium and also a width of full. There we go. And inside of this div is where the entire magic will happen for the input element. Now we could do all of the input logic and displaying the search results and so on ourselves. 
That is totally possible, but it does take a lot of time and it doesn't make sense for this video if there are already really accessible, nice components we can use for that. And one of them is from a UI library called ShadCN, and it's called the command component inside of here. It's basically a very little abstraction component that we can use to beautifully and accessibly display or search results out of the box that we're gonna use in this video. Um, so for example, we can search in here and it's gonna show us the relevant search results just like that. It's really useful and we're gonna make full use of it um, in this video. Now to get set up with this UI library, it's super simple. Go into your CMD and type in npx shad cn ui at the latest and then in it. And that's gonna ask us a bunch of questions to set up this UI library that we're gonna answer together right now once it loads. For example, the style that we would like to use, let's go for New York. Let's go for zinc as the base color. But again, all of this, also the style, they really are just personal preference. Whatever you prefer, I prefer this kind of setup. Um, would you like to use CSS variables? Yes, we definitely want those. And that's gonna set up our globals.css uh, for us. And I hope it doesn't overwrite what we already have in there. Oh man, it did. It overwrote, oh, okay, it overwrote our grainy class. Well, let's paste it back in. I didn't know it would do that, that sucks. Um, let's quickly grab our grainy class and paste that back in uh, just so we don't lose the kind of background texture uh, we have in here. Just looks a bit better that way. And after getting set up with our UI library, we can say npx shadcn ui at latest and we can add the command component and hit enter. And that's basically going to create a new folder in our app right here under components slash UI with a new command um, file in here that's gonna set up everything for us, install the packages we need for it. And basically it builds on top of a package called CMDK. So ShadCN, the UI library author, didn't just all do this himself, but this does build on top of existing packages. And with that in place, let's get started on our page.tsx inside of the div that we just created. So what are we gonna do? Inside of here, we're gonna put the command component we have just installed. And man, these suggestions from VS Code take up so much screen space, it's ridiculous. I really dislike that. And that seems new to me, that didn't happen before. Um, anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, right now, let's let's keep building this and let's make this beautiful. Sometimes I feel like it's just maybe a bit hard for you to see the code that I'm writing if there's like really big overlays from VS Code, but whatever. Okay, so the thing is we already have a state for the input, right? Where we keep track of whatever the user types in into this input field. And we are gonna make use of that to keep this command as a controlled kind of input. So this is going to happen inside of the command component, inside of the command input that we also get from our component slash UI slash command, both of them right here, which is basically the code that our UI library put into our own project. That's what I mean with the zero abstraction, right? And this command input can be self-closing and this is going to get four kind of um, props we're gonna pass in here. First off is gonna be the value and this is gonna be our input, so what the user types in. Second thing is gonna be the on value change. This gives us back the string. You don't have to follow along with this, I just want to show you what this does. So basically it gives us the string that the user typed into the um, kind of command input. And instead of doing something like this, where we, where we receive the string and then say set input to that string, right, to the user input, there is a shorthand we can use for this, which is basically just passing the set input. That's automatically going to take whatever we get access to in the callback function and call or set input function with it. So this is just a really nice shorthand, but it does the same thing as this, right? It just looks a lot cleaner. Third thing is gonna be a placeholder, and this is gonna say search countries dot 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 so it's clear to users what they can do in here and the last thing is going to be the class name that we're going to pass in here so this is going to be a placeholder oops placeholder colon so that's how we can specifically address the um, placeholder right here in css and we're going to say text zinc of 500 and let's it already enter to see what this looks like and did we start up our development server no we did not uh, so let's quickly do that and we can close this down. And once that loads, perfect, we can see, uh, let's move this into a side-by-side. -side. We can see the command input right here. Beautiful, search countries. This already looks absolutely great out of the box, much better than the input we had before. 
Beautiful, that's our command input. And now to actually list the search results that we get back from our API, right? How do we do that? And that's gonna happen inside of the command list also from our custom component that we're gonna put below the command input. This is gonna be responsible for two things. First off, displaying the empty state. If we don't have search results, in that case, we're gonna display an empty state right here. How do we check if we have search results? Well, we can say um, in a dynamic kind of syntax right here, the search results question mark dot results dot length, if that is zero, right, triple equal to zero, in that case, we're gonna render out some JSX, and in the other case, we're gonna render out null. And the beautiful thing is the JSX that we're gonna render out if we don't have search results is already done for us. So this is gonna be the command empty, also from our uh, custom component. And then here we can say no results found, period. So if we don't have any search results, this is what we're gonna show to the user. It automatically looks good because it is pre-styled. We can see that if we go into it, kind of already has some pre-styling applied to it. Beautiful. And now for displaying the actual search results, and it's gonna happen very similarly, right? We're gonna do a check right below the conditional check we just did, and this is gonna be search results dot results. If we have those, right? If the array is truthy, in that case, we're gonna render out some JSX, and in the other case, as always, we are gonna render out null. Now, what is the JSX that we want to render out? Basically, it is gonna be a command group, which is also a component we get from our custom component. And the heading of this is going to be results. Great, and with that heading in place, let's actually display the search results, right? Super important. And we can do that by mapping over the search results that we get back from our backend, which are nothing else than a string array, if you remember. So we can say search results question mark, because once again, this can be undefined, right? If we don't have the data yet at the very start of the rendering cycle, this is going to be undefined and we're gonna map over the results. So dot map over the results right here. And for each result that we get access to in the callback function, we can render out some JSX right away. And the JSX that we are going to render out is gonna be a command command item, also from our custom UI um, kind of component, right? And this is not going to be self-closing, it is going to contain the result, which if you remember, the string array, right? So this is gonna be a single string, each result, which is the actual country. So like Germany or India or United States of America, and whatever we're searching for. That's what we're rendering out right here. And this command item also gets um, a couple properties. For one, that's the key, because every time we map over something in React, we need to pass the top level item a unique identifier, a key, and this is gonna be the result. The value of this is going to be also the result. And lastly, we can pass this an on select handler. And basically this is gonna set the input as well. And if you remember the shorthand right here, again, all this means is basically we receive the event and it's the same syntax as then executing whatever function we pass into it by just um, kind of forwarding the event to it. This is just a really nice syntactic sugar um, on top of that, but it does the exact same thing. So let's try this out, man. Uh, let's save the file, let's reload the page and then hopefully we should see our search results. So if we type something in, then we should see our search results. Oh, and of course we don't, because we never actually assign the response we get back from the server. Well, that makes sense. So let's uh, do that. So let's say const data, so the actual data we get back from the backend, and this is gonna be in parentheses, await res.json. So we are converting the response we get back from the backend to JSON. And then we're gonna type, or we're gonna cast this into a TypeScript type. So we can say as, so we're telling TypeScript what the type of the result will be. And this is exactly what we send back from the backend. So if we take a look at what we see in the, or what we get back in the front end, right? It is essentially the data structure that we have right here. It's a results, a string array, and it is also a duration as a number. So we can tell our front end exactly that. We can say results are gonna be a string array. And then also the Dur oops, duration we get back on the front end is gonna be a number. And the benefit of this is that we now get type safety on the front end and can, for example, set the search results to the data that we get back just like so, because the data structure here 
And what we get back from the back end is, of course, right here. You see that the exact same. Beautiful. Let's save that and see what happens. So right now we should really see our search results. So let's type this in. Oh, perfect. India, Indonesia. Let's type in G-E-R. U-N-I-T, United, perfect. Very, very nice. We can type in just an A. And right now, the, you can see probably that these results are kind of grayed out and they're not clickable, right? Which is really weird. And the reason for this is that the CMDK package, CMDK, let me show you that, actually received a update, a breaking change very recently. They upgraded to the 1.0. And in Shad CN, well, that didn't really work out. It still used the kind of old implementation. And the breaking change happens right here in our command. And the difference is that we need to change some things in here. Let me see where those are. Uh, so basically, it also depends on when you're following along with this video, right? If you watch this video right after it comes out, then probably you need to follow along right now. If you watch this in a month or two, then, hey, maybe this is already fixed, right? Um, but in my case, this is not fixed yet. So we need to change the data disabled right here. For example, where the pointer events are um, none inside of the command item, we need to change that to data minus disabled is equal to in the single quotes true, right? Because if it's undefined, this is also going to be falsy and we need to insert this check and um, basically here and then the same thing um, down here for the opacity 50 and then hit save. And that should get rid of the problem which was just um, caused by these two lines right here. So let's search for A, perfect, that works. We can now click these and that's going to actually um, select the country. Germany, let's type A, we can navigate through with our arrow keys and then also select using the enter key. Very, very nice. Um, now we don't we don't need the other input, right? That just looks bad. Uh, we replace it with the command, which is accessible. It looks much better. So we can completely get rid of the old input and just use the command instead. Um, very, very nice. Uh, we get an error here, but if we reload the page, that should be gone. Sometimes Next.js does that once you make a change and then reload it for the first time. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. But once you reload it for multiple times, that is actually gone, right? And then we can search for any country in here. Very, very nice. One thing we didn't do yet is display how long the search took. And I think that would be a cool addition actually to get a feel um, of how fast this actually is. So right below the check, still inside of the command list, but below the null right here is where we are going to do that. Let's insert another conditional check here. And this is going to check the search results dot results. So if we have results, then we're going to render out some JSX. And as always in the other case, and we're just going to render out null, just nothing. And the JSX that we are going to render out is going to be a React fragment because we're going to put two elements in here and we don't want to add any element to the DOM for that. So that's why we use a React fragment. First one is going to be a self-closing div and this is going to get a class name of height px for one pixel, a width of full and a background sync of 200. And if you're wondering what this does, all this is is like a visual separator between the search results and the actual you know, time that we're going to display to the user. And to actually show the user that duration and how many results we found, let's insert a P tag with a class name of padding two, a text of XS for extra small. And let's also put a text zinc of 500 inside of here. In the P tag, let's say found, and then we're going to insert the number of how many search results we have, which is nothing else than the search results dot results dot length, right? That's how long the array of results is. That's how many results we got. And we're going to say results in, and then we're going to insert the second dynamic value, which is going to be a search results dot duration dot to fixed of uh, zero. And all the to fix does is take the number we get back from the backend in milliseconds and limits it to the, well, basically, uh, this is kind of hard to say in English, but if we have like this as the number from the back end, right? Super long comma number. Then the to fix zero basically says, well, we limit it to zero um, numbers after the comma, right? So we don't have a comma. If this was two, then for example, this would be limited to the 0.12 as well, but we just want the milliseconds um, even more fine grained doesn't make sense. And then we're going to say MS for milliseconds because that's the unit that we measure this in. 
Beautiful. Let's try this out. Let's type A and we should be able to see found 14 results in 108 milliseconds. American Samoa found one result in 29 milliseconds. Really, really nice. Now, um, one very tiny detail that we can add if we want is going to be a lightning emoji and we can simply add that, copy it from the web, from Google somewhere and add it behind the speed search. I just think it uh, adds a little bit of color and just uh, looks kind of nice, but uh, you don't have to do that. This is just uh, purely optional. And now the important question is, is how do we deploy this to Cloudflare workers? Because that's, you know, the actual fast thing that we want to make API requests to. And the answer is that's actually super simple. So Cloudflare workers has a tool and that is called Wrangler. And Wrangler, let's go to this, is a command line interface for all things Cloudflare workers. Basically, it allows us to deploy to CF workers extremely easily. And let's get an overview. A lot of people are already using this because it's super simple. And we already set up everything that we need with our kind of wrangler.toml right here, right? So all we need to do is go into our command line and say pnpm install wrangler minus d for a development dependency. Uh, because we don't need this in production just for deploying this to CF workers. That's going to install Wrangler. And now we can simply go into our package.json and define a script to deploy our application. So how do we want to call this? Let's call this deploy. This is going to be our deploy script. So whenever we run yarn deploy, that's going to run the Wrangler deployment to Cloudflare workers. And that deploy script is going to be Wrangler deploy. Well, pretty intuitive, right? And we're going to pass this two arguments. We're going to say dash dash minify. And we're also going to say dash dash name. And then whatever name you want to give this, uh, for example, like, I don't know, maybe fast API or whatever you want to call this um, in your account, that's going to show up in your Cloudflare dashboard. And we also need to pass this the route of the file that we want to deploy. And this is going to be source slash app slash API slash and then the double angle brackets dot 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 route uh, closing angle brackets slash route dot ts. So basically going from our source folder into app API route route dot ts. This is the file that we want to pass in as a uh, argument here into the package.json. And let's run this. Let's try it out. Let's close all of this, clear the screen and run yarn deploy and hit enter. Now, if you've never worked with Cloudflare workers and we're going to fix the bug here in a second, don't worry. Uh, unexpected character, expected string number, date, time, boolean. Okay, we probably need to wrap this in quotes. We're going to do that in a second. Or actually, no, let's uh, go ahead and fix that right now. It's a very, very simple fix. We can simply grab our environment variables in the wrangler.toml and wrap them inside of quotes. Right, so that's what it's complaining about. Um, these need to be wrapped in quotes. And then let's try that again. Let's run yarn deploy. That's going to run our Wrangler deploy minify name fast API and so on. And that worked beautiful. Now for you, if you've never worked with Cloudflare before, um, chances are it's not going to be that easy, but it's going to ask you to log in first. Basically, you I think you get a link that you need to click on. That's going to take you to the Cloudflare dashboard. And mine is on German here. Let's switch that to English. That's going to take you to the Cloudflare dashboard where you need to log in. And then you're going to be logged in into your CLI as well. And that then allows you to actually publish your script. So if I were to log into Cloudflare workers um, right here, it's workers.cloudflare.com. And we log in here together. Let's click the login. Let's accept the cookies. I'm going to log in here. There we go. I've logged in and this is um, what the dashboard then looks like, right? So we can see I've tried out some things here, next back and fast search and the fast API that we just deployed. So under dash.cloudflare.com, this is where your um, Cloudflare workers will then be listed once you deploy them. And in here we get all the metrics and logs and request times and everything um, that is kind of important to or Cloudflare worker. And we also get the URL that we need to make a request to. So if we see the logs right here, we can see we deployed or Cloudflare worker under the URL and my console is bugged. It doesn't show us. So let's try this again. Let's run yarn deploy. That's going to just deploy everything again. Um, and that's going to give us the URL. So let's see this. There we go. Publish fast API, HTTPS, 
uh, and so on and so on. And this is the API that we can now make requests to. So let's try this out. Let's enter this um, URL that Cloudflare gave us for the deployment into our browser and then under slash API slash search and then question mark Q is equal to, uh, for example, GER for Germany. Um, we can type that in and we get an error, something went wrong. Aha, and the problem is, and I just saw the problem here um, in Cloudflare. If we take a look at the logs, right? We can see everything that goes wrong and that goes right. And the error message that we get in the worker is that reference error process is not defined. And the problem here is that Redis tries to use these values by default from our ENV file, from process. So it assumes a Node.js runtime, right? But this is not a Node.js runtime. This doesn't work. So all we need to do to fix this is say slash Cloudflare at the very end right here. So upstash Redis knows that we are trying to run this in the worker D runtime. Then we can save that, hit yarn deploy once again, and hopefully that will fix all the issues with our API route. I mean, the variables are there after all those are correctly set up in our wrangler.toml. Um, so we should be able to deploy this. And there we are. Perfect. We can see results in Germany. Let me zo uh, zoom in here and the duration it took for this search. Beautiful. 44 milliseconds for Germany. Hey, dude, this is super cool. Okay, perfect. And the last thing we can do right now is if you wanted to deploy this entire project to Vercel, for example, is instead of making a request to this URL, we can simply prefix that with the URL that Cloudflare gave us. For example, this one, right? So we can paste that in and now we're getting all our data from our actual backend hosted around the entire globe by Cloudflare. So let's quickly try out if that works. Let's start back up our development server and save or changes with the remote URL that we're now making requests to. Let's navigate to localhost 3000 and ideally everything should work just as fine as making a request to our local endpoint, right? Because essentially same thing, right? Because it's just our route.ts that now runs um, remotely distributed around the entire um, world, right? So that's what I showed you in the diagram. That's going to be, where was it? Right here, the CF. These are automatically running in all regions of the world. So let's type in GER. That's going to make a request to our remote endpoint. And it seems like that doesn't work. And I, and dude, I already know why. And that's, again, super, super simple fix. Um, and that's going to be that this is a course error. And we can probably see that if we go into our network tab. Uh, let's let's make this again. Let's go to all, jer, m. And we can see, yeah status course error, very simple fix. This is exactly the same thing if you've ever worked with any kind of backend framework, right? We need to use a course middleware and all we need to do to fix this is say app.use and use the middleware that Hono provides to us. So for any route, so for slash star, any route in our entire app, we're gonna make use of the course middleware from Hono slash course and invoke that. And then simply go ahead and redeploy um, or backend to Cloudflare, right? To make use of that um, course middleware to allow requests from anywhere, basically, including localhost 3000. Once that's done, we can restart our development server and now this should work. Now this should really work. Uh, so we should get data from our remote environment from Cloudflare. So let's try this out. Let's reload this. All right, there we are. Let's type in GER, Germany, beautiful, 63 milliseconds. Let's type in United. 45 milliseconds. Dude, today Redis is today Redis is like really fast. This is much faster than wow. Okay, interesting. Uh let's type in I don't know, Azerbaijan. 43 milliseconds. Dude, this is seriously fast. Wow. But this is also oh, okay, yeah. This is local host. Probably that's why. Because the main database region is in Frankfurt, I guess. Beautiful. And you could even go as far as deploying this as is to Vercel um even use the Vercel API if you wanted to, right? Because we export at the very bottom both the app HTTP verb and the actual app as the default. This is compatible with both Cloudflare workers and Vercel out of the box. Um, so for example, you could use the front end and deploy it to Vercel and um, get all your backend data from the Cloudflare worker, which I did in the demo, which is the fastest way, um, but you can always change your mind if you want to. So dude, beautiful job, I really hope you enjoyed this project. It was a ton of fun to build. I really like this. We got animations in here. This was just a ton of fun to build. Um, it's fully accessible. It's super damn fast. 
And it's not just for search functionality, right? If you want any kind of speed in your API for search or for whatever you can imagine, right? This is the infrastructure to do it. Um, or, well, should I say this is the infrastructure to do it. It works um, just super nicely out of the box and I'm really happy with it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. I really hope you do. Thanks a lot for following along. I hope you learned a lot that you can use in your future projects and then let me do the outro in person. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed. This was a ton of fun to make. As you can probably tell from the video, I, I had a lot of fun doing it and it's just super useful. Knowing how to build a high performance, high speed API that is globally distributed. It's just, it's just a really cool thing to know because it's useful for a lot of cases, like for example, the search functionality or I've had use cases at work or in personal projects in the past where knowing this would have been really useful, but I didn't. And now you do and now I do. And it's just a really cool technique. So I really hope you enjoyed following along. That's gonna be it for me for this video. And I'm gonna see you in the next one. Until then, have a good one and bye bye.